Welcome to First Lutheran Church, where you're among friends in Christ. I'm Reverend Thomas Rothy. I'm glad you've joined us today, and it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit, working through the gospel, touches your heart and changes your life. May the Lord bless you today and throughout the rest of the week. Our first or Old Testament lesson for the day is recorded in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. We read the 20th chapter, beginning at the 7th verse. The faithful prophet Jeremiah proclaimed the Lord's judgment against sin. On one hand, he wants to quit preaching to avoid persecution at the hands of his own countrymen. On the other hand, he cannot hold back. Spirit-born zeal for his Lord burns within him. The same conflicting forces are at war within us. To whom can we turn for help? We confidently commit our cause to the Lord Almighty, who will rescue us from our apparent persecutions, we read. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side, Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, 
Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Here ends our, first, our second or epistle lesson for the day, of which a portion will serve as our sermon text. is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans. We read the fifth chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse. Here we're reminded that sin is never alone. It is always accompanied by death. All of Adam's children must die as Adam did, because all of us have inherited Adam's sin. But thanks be to God, he sent the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who by his death restored holiness and life to all of Adam's children, we read. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Here ends our second lesson. Alleluia. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Alleluia. 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 The gospel lesson for the day is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew. We read the 10th chapter, beginning at the 24th verse. Here Jesus tells us about the crosses that we will bear as his disciples. We can expect the world to treat us no better than it treated our master. What a comfort to know that our life, death, and eternal future are in the hands of a God who gives loving attention to creatures far less significant than we are. He takes careful inventory of the smallest details of our lives. Therefore, we are bold and cheerful in proclaiming his gospel in a hostile world, we read. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household so do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. 
so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Here ends our gospel lesson. Lesson, today's second lesson will serve as our sermon text. Dear friends in Christ, it might not be as popular as it once was, but it's still pretty popular. What I'm referring to is flipping houses. To flip a house means to take an older, outdated house and through demolition and rebuilding, transform it into a beautiful house that you can call home. Let's face it, over time, a house tends to get run down and outdated. And unlike clothing, you can't wait long enough for a style to come back and be popular. Also, a house can't flip itself. Someone has to do it. In the portion of God's word that we have before us this morning, we hear of a flip of sorts. And just as a house can't flip itself, this flip is done by someone else. This morning, then, let's meditate on the theme. Talk about a flip. From sinner to saint. The Apostle Paul begins our sermon text. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin... And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. The Apostle Paul begins with the subject of sin. Who's the one person who brought sin into the world? It's Adam. And as the father of us all, he left us with the inheritance of sin's punishment of death. So, Adam was the world's first sinner, and you and I, some 120 billion, give or take a few billion people later. With this subject of sin, I can't help but think of that hypothetical question that was asked year in and year out in confirmation class. That question was, if Adam hadn't sinned, would we be sinners? How would you answer that question? If your answer is no, is it because it was Adam's sin that made us all sinners? This Bible verse appears to be telling us that. Or, if your answer is yes, is it because you're thinking someone down the ancestry line would have probably given in to temptation and sinned? Both answers 
are plausible. Remember, it is a hypothetical question. I think Paul's intent with this Bible verse is to remind us of the power of sin and what it's done to mankind. How powerful is sin? Very powerful. It causes us to sin in thought, word, and deed. Paul adds that it's so powerful that it can end life and leave death. Paul further adds that it's so powerful that it leaves its stamp on all people. Think of sin like a powerful gene that gets passed down from generation to generation. I was reminded of this recently when I received a picture of my nephew's firstborn. From the Rothy side of the family, all you could hear coming out of their mouth was, he's got Grandpa George's nose. Well, just as a gene for a physical trait was passed down, sin, or as it's also known, as inherited sin, was passed down to all people, beginning with Adam and making it all the way down to you and me. If the story of mankind's existence ended here, it wouldn't be a very happy story. Whoever wants a story to end in death no one. And this story doesn't have to have a sad ending. And do you know why? A flip takes place. Through the fall into sin, Adam became a sinner, deserving of sin's punishment of death. But he was flipped. He was flipped into a saint through the righteousness that only comes through God's one and only Son. As Paul continues our sermon text, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all people, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, we also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Talk about a flip. Adam, who was a lost and condemned sinner, became a saint. How did that happen? Do you remember God's word to Satan in Adam and Eve's hearing. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That enmity was God's son, Jesus. God would send him to crush the devil's head thereby doing away with sin and death. And he would replace sin and death with righteousness and life. 
Do you like this comparison or contrast of Adam and Christ? I do. And obviously, so does the Apostle Paul. Both of their actions, Adam's sin and Christ's righteousness, changed mankind's status before God. Through faith in the promise of a Savior, Adam was flipped from a sinner to a saint. And through faith in the fulfillment of the promise of this Savior, referring to Jesus' birth, life, and death, we have been flipped from a sinner to a saint. This morning's sermon text is really an excellent lesson on the doctrine of justification. Justification is the process by which God declared all people righteous or innocent of sin. Did you catch that? I said God declared all people righteous and innocent of sin. And not just believers. You see, all mankind are justified through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we neatly sum up the two things that Jesus did to make us righteous. The first thing that Jesus did was keep the law perfectly on our behalf. When God gave his law to his people, he told them that they needed to keep it perfectly. But there was one problem, remember? Sin. It wouldn't allow them to keep the law perfectly. That's when Jesus stepped in and obeyed the law perfectly on our behalf. The second thing that Jesus did was that he died for the sins of the world. The wages of sin is death, remember? Only death can pay the debt of sin that we owe God. And it took the death of the sinless Son of God to pay off sin in full. These two actions on Jesus' part clothe us with his righteousness and solidifies our status as saints. And this all happens only because of grace through faith. God's love, as dispensed through his word, penetrates our cold, sinful hearts and produces saving faith. Think of God's grace like a big water pipe. A water pipe is the means by which water enters your home and reaches the faucet. No pipe, no water. In a similar way, the gospel and God's word is the means by which God's grace enters your home or body. Without the gospel, no grace, no saving faith. Make sure that that gospel pipe doesn't get shut off. Baptism is a good means of grace that changes sinners to saints. Holy Communion is a good means of grace that changes sinners to saints. Both the spoken and written word are good means of grace that changes sinners to saints. 
Make sure to remain close to the gospel in word and sacrament so that your flip doesn't become a flop. If I asked you, which term would you like me to use in describing you? Sinner or saint? Which would it be? I'm pretty sure that it would be saint. But the fact of the matter is that you were sinner through Adam first, and saint through Christ second. May we always be grateful for Jesus' righteousness that makes us a saint. And may we always, always be grateful for the Holy Spirit's gift of faith that enables us to receive Jesus' righteousness. God grants it for his sake. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. spending some time with us today. You have been watching First Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Reverend Thomas Rothy invites you to tune in again next week, or if you have the opportunity to worship with us live on Sunday morning at 9.30. First Evangelical Lutheran Church is located at 231 Smoke Tree Lane, Prescott, Arizona. If you are in need of spiritual assistance or would just like more information, please call 445 2807. May God's word.